to work. I gotta turn it up one notch. All right. Hey, I got a green light there. That tells me that that's working. Hey, first one, Diane. Well, while while I'm waiting for people to show up, I'm going to write out the scale for today. Uh, and this is we're going to do a D form diatonic scale. I'm sorry, this, uh, the C form. C form, boom, 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 boom. It's very exciting watching me write draw scales. And I'm going to put a circle around the lowest D and an X through the lowest B. So we have the major and minor related. Hey! Super coach, Michelle. Hey, you made it, Michelle. <laughs> I keep getting notes from you. Oh, I missed it. Mayunk, right? Mayunk. We're getting our team together here. We probably, you know, when this is all said and done, when this is all over, we all need to hang out and meet somewhere. Somewhere warm, <laughs> right? Uh, let's see what sounds do I have. Uh, that's the high gain. All right. All right. We're getting everybody. Oh, you've only missed one. Okay. That maybe that was the one I was thinking. Kathy. Wow. Gary. Everybody. <laughs> hey, my shirt. Okay. Well. Okay, so yeah, this is the same shirt I wore yesterday. That says Zawinol Foundation, Joe Zawinol, who was the uh, keyboard player, the guy that started um, uh, Weather Report. And I never got, I never got into Weather Report. I have to admit, but his son Tony is running the foundation, and we are, we have a mutual friend. And I got asked to do like a clinic uh, for some kids, and I did it, and they gave me the shirt. <laughs> so that's it. And then this shirt. Okay, this shirt is is a like a twenty year old Abercrombie and Fitch shirt. I've had it. I bought it new at Abercrombie, literally like twenty years ago. And we're sitting down. We're 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 sitting on the sofa. And we're watching Friends, and Joey walks into the room and he's wearing the exact same shirt, the exact shirt. And so I actually stood in front of the TV and took you know had to froze the froze the uh, the broadcast and and took a picture with, with Joey and me. It's pretty funny. Oh man, Mahunk, Mayunk, Mayunk, not Mahunk, Mayunk, Ma Yunk. Anyway, I'm getting it. I'll get it. I'll get it. So where are we gonna meet when this is all over? Uh, Samal, I may. Uh, that's a pretty pretty advanced thing. I don't know if I'll get uh get to harmonizing scales. Um, but the simplest way to harmonize any scale is to go up a third. And then if you want to, so if you're playing, say a G and you're in the key of G, you're playing a G, you go up a third. And then if you go up another third in the scale and you go up another third, now you've got that, which is basically a, a G major seven chord. And then if you do that with the A note, you get that. And then you go up B note, you get that. And and C note, you would get this. D note, you would get, uh, what am I thinking now? And then this, and so on and so forth. So um, it's it's kind of, um, it's a combination of harmonizing um, notes is kind of a combination of knowing theory and knowing your fretboard, which is stuff we're talking about. I'm really, you know, like I said, you know, I'm big on learning the fretboard. Um, you got your guitars in your hand. Let's let's go ahead and do, let's do our pinky warm up, okay? while we're hanging. Okay, so we start with the first finger on the first fret and then go, we're gonna go one, four, three, four, two, four, three, four. Oops, I have to click in the window first. One, four, three, four, two, four, three, four. Wisconsin, oh, heck no. <laughs> oh, actually, I'm sure it's amazing. 
I sure, I, I, yeah, I've been to Wisconsin, and I used to spend summers in Michigan, so kind of a similar. Okay, yeah, where are you now, my young? Where do you live now? Got my coffee. Okay. I wonder if my that's where my friend Brad lives. Okay, so let's do this. Um, first finger on the first fret. Small, I'll stop it. <laughs> God bless you. What what currency is that? Is that Deutschmark? DKK? No, Deutschmark. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, not, the Germans are on the Euro. If it's Deutschmark, it wouldn't be worth anything. So, okay. So, uh, first finger on the first fret. Okay. And then pinky, third, four. Oh, cool. Danish crowns. Wait. So, you're in, let's see, Denmark. Let's see. Denmark's on the Euro. So, but you're on a Denmark province, which would make it, I don't know where. The... So, okay, sorry. I'm getting off into my world um, maps. So I'm a little groggy. I took a sleeping pill in the middle of the night because I, I got up in the middle of the night and go, no, 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 no. And just an over counter one, not like anything dangerous, don't worry. Um, and I woke up at like 9.40, just like ready to sleep. So, okay. So here we go again. One. Four, three, four, two, four, three, four. Up a fret. One, four, three, four, two, four, three, four. One, two, oh, sorry. One, four, three, four, two, four, three, four. Oh, that's good to know, Jim. Up a fret to the fourth fret. One, four, three, four, two, four, three, four. Nice. Okay, fifth fret. One, four, three, four, two, four, three, four. Sixth fret. One, four, three, four, two, four, three, four. Seventh fret. One, four, three, four, two, four, three, four. Okay, you're in India. Yeah, I hear you guys are going on lockdown now too. Okay, down to the bottom. Uh, let's do on the same thing on the bottom string, okay? So we have to reach over a little bit more. It might be a little tougher for some of you, uh, but that's good. It should be good, you know, difficult. So, okay, one, four, three, four, two, four, three, four. One, four, hey, Bill. Two, four, three, four. Up a fret to the third fret. One, four, three, four, two, four, three, four. Two more. Up a fourth fret. One, four, three, four, two, four, three, four. And then one more, fifth fret. Four, three, four, two, four, three, four. It's a pretty good warm up. Like I said, every other note is your pinky. So it's designed to give get, get your pinky a little stronger, to get your pinky in the game. And to try to keep your pinky kind of hovering over the fretboard like it's going to be needed, okay? So, all right. So we've been talking about the caged method um, for the last seven days, and we're going to con continue on it. I'm hoping that it's this is still uh, interesting and relevant. It's definitely the, the idea of the caged method is to take the five basic chords that you already know and start to visualize them on the fretboard for rhythm purposes, to find chords everywhere, okay? Because you can, you know, a definition of a chord is two or more notes. So you pick any two of those notes. You don't have to be able to play like this form of the, the G form D chord, which is the G chord slid up, 
to the seventh fret. You don't need to be able to play that. But if you can see that, you know, if you can see like these, those three notes, that's a great voicing of a D chord. So if I do something like a, and so that voicing that I'm playing right now is uh, X nine, X seven, X 10. Yeah, you guys are all from all over the place. Um, okay, so you can see that's, and that's a really cool voice. And, and it's from bottom to top, it's actually a, what's called a first inversion um, chord. So it means this, this is where theory, you know, it's the, the, the terminology doesn't really line up with how it should be. But if the root, if the root's in the bottom, if the root's the lowest note of the chord, then it's root inversion. That makes sense. So if it were like D and an A and an F, like this one, D, A, F sharp, okay, um, then that would be a root inversion chord. Um, the next tone in the triad is the third, okay? So if the third is in the bottom, like this one, like the one we just did, okay, and you can finger it, yeah, yeah. That's probably the best way to figure it. If the third is in the bottom, that's called first inversion. <laughs> so it's like, wait, if the third is in the bottom, it's first inversion. Yep. And if the fifth is in the bottom, it's second inversion. So basically, you're going up by thirds, and it's the next inversion. Technically, and I've never really heard anyone refer to it, but if if you had the, well, seventh and seventh in the bass would be third inversion. If you had the ninth of the chord in the bass, that would be technically fourth inversion. But I've never ever heard anyone say, play a four fourth inversion chord. Usually it's root, first and second inversion. Those are the only ones you're really going to hear. Um, you know, in music school, maybe you might get a little deeper than that, but uh, it's not that. Yeah, it's a spread. Yeah, I would call that a spread triad. Very piano, you know, very piano-like. I like that voice. I love, the, I love this voice, and I use this one all the time. Um, the major one, and the way I'm fingering that one is X seven nine X nine X, and that's just a D major triad. Okay, I love that that voicing, and then you can make it D minor by going X seven. This is fine on on acoustic too. Eight X, and that would be D minor. So check this out. I'm gonna get a a more, I'm going to do a different tone. Uh, let's see. We get one that's like, you know, kind of like a soundtracky tone with lots of reverb and delay, you know, pretty kind of um, tone. And uh, I use it sometimes for pop writing or soundtrack stuff. What am I looking for? Oh, here we go. Not too many sounds. All right. Yeah, those are those are very piano like voicings, um, and that's why I really like using them. And if you're using, it's they're hard to do if you're strumming. You know, you can do it with a pick, but you have to make sure you're muting really good because otherwise it's going to sound like. <laughs> okay, I actually really really like that. Um, yeah, no, and it is that is a deep. That is a D chord. Yeah, that's just a first inversion D chord. F sharp. I'm sorry. Uh, what did I do? Oh, I got two Ds in this one. Yeah, so F sharp D. Uh, that's the first one I wrote. Yeah, it's just two Ds and then one F sharp. There's no fifth in this voicing. But you don't have, like I said, two notes is technically a chord. Even if you do, I mean, you, you could call two notes, you could call that a dyad. Sometimes I'll have... How do you spell dyad? Is it really just dyad? I think that's how you spell it. I'm not sure. 
Um, but you, you know, sometimes people will say play diets. I like to sometimes play thirds, like, you know. Those would be dyads. Okay. So those are just two, two notes. All right. So now my point basically being um, that learning your fretboard, learning the, the, um, the cage shapes up and down the fretboard will open up a lot of chord voicings that you can kind of, oh, I can do this. You know, I don't need to do all of these chords. You could just do, I, you know, I just sometimes will do those two. Uh, one of my favorite chords right now is that one where I'm playing the two thirds. Um, so, um, but the, the first shape of the cage or the first, you know, in the first letter in the word cage to C, And so that's the first shape we're, we're starting with. And again, if we were to find all the C chords up the neck using those five shapes, we would have, this is C, the A form, here's C again, here's the G form, C, that's a C chord. Here's the E form, right, C, and here's the D form, C. So the, um, so the, the shape we're going to play, we're going to come up with a scale around is this. And so before our pentatonic scale was, was this one, it was, you can play, let's play the pentatonic scale together. The, the C shape one. So second fret, fifth fret, second fret, fifth fret, second fret, fourth fret. Second fret, fourth fret, third fret, fifth fret, and on the top string, two, four. And it's all, we're all in what's called second position, which means our first finger is going to be assigned the uh, second fret. Okay. So we have one, I'm sorry, first finger, fourth finger. First finger, fourth finger. So you can just practice that. Okay, and then you can do the next two, which would be first finger on the D string, second fret, and then third finger, and then first finger and third finger. So play that box. You can go backwards too. Last two strings, second uh, finger on the third fret. This is this is would be the D major pentatonic and the B minor pentatonic, the same same scale. We have second, four, first, four. So this is D, D major pentatonic. I'll hold up that page again, okay? Or also. E minor pentatonic. All right. So, um, and then Samal, I saw, you know, you, you, you think sometimes whatever's on the bottom you think is the root. Yeah, it's often not the case. And so um, if you were to consider that F sharp the root, then this would be some kind of weird F sharp augmented chord. And that just doesn't make sense because it doesn't sound like any kind of, you know, it doesn't sound like an augmented chord. It's literally just D over F sharp. You know, it'd be like playing D chord with a thumb like that. If you play D, and sometimes you want to grab that F sharp on the bottom to make it a, a first inversion. <laughs> Put the third on the bottom to make it a first inversion chord. It, just so complex necessarily so but uh but anyway and the, the, the term inversions are really that's more piano lingo um uh scoring lingo you know i don't really hear that a whole lot among guitar players but you do yes b is the relative minor to d major and we talked about that yesterday so let me let me hold up that um uh the page here and you guys can do a screenshot if you haven't already um this is all of the all of the pentatonic shapes in D major and B minor in the, in the five different forms to a screen cap. And then we're going to have a new scale today. We're going to take this scale 
and we're going to fill it in. Remember, penta means five. So there's only five notes in a pentatonic scale. So, so the D major pentatonic is D, E, F sharp, A, and B. Um, and um, the B minor one would be B, D, E, F sharp, and A. Same exact notes, except starting on the B. So it's relative. Hey, Ben. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to add two more notes to it. So instead of being D pentatonic, it's going to be D diatonic. So it's then now it's a do re mi scale. Okay. So that one's here's the pentatonic. One, two, three, four, five. And then we get to root again. And diatonic is seven notes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then the root. So it's, you know, once you get to the octave, that's, that's the same note. So it's not seven different notes. Okay. So now here's the, here's one of the things that I, I could in, in this, in this, our C shape region. Okay. And keep in mind these scales, these scales here are all movable. So that's not, that's not five scales. Okay. That's um, 60 scales because they're completely movable. You learn one scale on the guitar that doesn't use open strings. As long as there are no open strings involved, you use do one scale and you can move it up at any fret. So you've technically got 12 scales in every key. Okay. So, um, it, you know, so if you have a D major scale, you have, you have every major scale. If you learn this. All right. Now my temptation is to just show you D to D or for the D major scale or B to B for the B minor scale. I didn't touch my face. So if I touch my face, you have to take a, a sip of tea or coffee or water or something. Tom's drinking game. Um, and so I, that's that's my temptation, but I don't want to show you that small of a scale. I want you. I want to show you every note in this position, in in the realm of this C shape. Okay, I want to show you every note in there that's in the key of D. So basically, we're going to have almost three notes per string. There's going to be one string that we're only going to have two notes on. Okay, so I'm going to do a screen cap. All right, I mean, I'm going to hold up this this new scale, and um, let's see here. Oh, where's my new? Here it is. Okay, so this is it. I'm sorry for the penmanship, but um, hopefully you can see that, and maybe you can take the screen cap. And if you're working on a laptop or something, you can, I mean, on a desktop, you can kind of crop it and put it to the left so you can have it in front of you while we, while we play through it. Okay. So we're going to be in what's called second position. So when I say second position, that means your first finger is assigned all the second fret notes. Your second finger is going to be assigned all the third fret notes. The fourth finger is, or third finger is going to be assigned all the third fret notes. And the fourth finger is going to be assigned to all the fifth, fr fifth fret notes. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. Oh, as far as finding the relative minor, we talked about this yesterday and relative major. Um, what I like to do, if I'm going to find the relative minor, I go, you go down a half step and then down a whole step. So in, on guitar lingo, go down one fret and then go down two more because that find, that's how you find it scale wise. And that's a much more useful, um, way of thinking of it, I think, because a lot of times when you're going to a relative minor, see what I did there? So I'm, I can play G or I could substitute the E minor chord. We did this yesterday. Um, we substituted E minor for G uh, because that's one trick of reharmonizing something to change the, change the chords of a song, but be able to still sing the same melody. That's called reharmonizing. Um, we substituted the E minor for the G in one in this case yesterday. You can watch that video. You can go back. All these are I'm keeping them all uploaded. I'm keeping all the live chats there, so you can read all that if you want to too. So, um, but if you go down one fret or a half step, you get F sharp, and then you go down a whole two more frets, you get E. But if you want to think of it as you can think of it as three semitones or four notes if you're counting the first one, but that's going to get you, it might get you in trouble. I don't know. I like to think go down one fret and then go down two frets and there's your relative minor. And the same is true going up. So if you, you're in E minor and you're going, what's the relative major? 
because you can substitute a G major chord for an E minor. Um, and so, you know, it makes the song a little more happy. It might take a sad melody and make it sound a little bit more happy. Uh, but you would go up two half steps or to a whole step. I'm sorry. Yeah, a whole step is equal to two half steps. You go up to G sharp and then up to G. Yeah, Samal, this is the first time I've seen you, so. Okay, so let's play that scale. We're gonna, I'm gonna go super slow because I do have a feeling. So anyone here who's advanced, you can just take that screenshot and start shredding it if you want. But um, if you're a very beginner, I don't want, I want you to try to at least make a try, effort at doing this. If your fingers don't want to do it, um, I understand that. Um, Heck, even if you have to just go one finger on all these notes, <laughs> you're still the idea here is to start to visualize the C shape. And then what, what will happen is, as you see the C shape, then you'll see, oh, here's the pentatonic. You'll start to see that shape. And then you can start to see the diatonic. And then now you're, the, the fretboard, re, fretboard really starts to open up for you. Okay. All right. So the first note we're going to do, like I said, we're not do, starting on D. We're not starting on B. So these are all the notes in this position that are in the key of D. So we're gonna we're, we're not gonna get to D until we get to the sixth note in this scale. Okay. So here's the first note, F sharp, second fret, first finger on the bottom string. Okay. Second finger on the third fret of the bottom string is G. And then fifth fret is A. All right. Those are the first three notes on the of the of the scale we're going to learn and they're on the bottom string so let's do that again second fret third fret with the second finger that's g and pinky a one more time second fret with the first finger third fret with the second finger and fifth fret with the pinky all right and and oh here's another thing there's really a not a whole lot of different um, little mini scale shapes that we're going to be doing a lot. We're going to do two, oh, sorry, one, two, four. And the next one is going to be one, three, four. And then there's going to be some one, two or one, um, one threes and maybe some two fours, but those are pretty much all the shapes that, you know, as far as your left hand uh, goes, we're not going to be doing any weird kind of shift downs or chromatic things. It's going to be very simple. So it's basically first, second, four for that first string. Okay. Um, I do have a video on help, somebody help me remember to, to post a link to the um, my that darn F chord and uh, that son of a B chord. Those two videos, I think, give you some real um, incur, you know, tips for playing bar chord, um, particularly the F chord, which is the one that most people come up against first. So, OK, on the fifth string, we're going to be second fret with the first finger. Okay, again, I'm going super slow for the beginners. Just don't. Don't be discouraged, just try. Third finger on the fourth fret of the fifth string, and then pinky on the fifth fret of the fifth string. And the notes are B. So now we're on the B minor. This is the start. This is where you would start a B minor scale. You would start on this note. And then C sharp. And I need to write that scale until you have all the notes. But and there's D, and there's where we would start the D major scale if we were doing it. So see, it took us six notes to get to that first D note. Okay, so let's play the the, the uh, A string again one more time. Second fret with the first finger. Third finger on the fourth fret and pinky on the fifth. Okay, now let's go down to the bottom string and do those first two strings. Bottom string, second fret with the first. Third fret with your second finger. Hopefully you can see my hand clearly. Pinky. And then at the first fret, uh, then first finger on the second fret, third finger on the fourth fret, and pinky on the fifth. It's hard to keep all these numbers straight. Strings, frets, fingers, all that stuff. <laughs> it just sounds like a myriad of numbers. It's like it's like when your cat, when you're talking to your cat, I just hear blah, 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 first fret, second fret, third finger, fourth fret. That's all they hear. Okay. Now here's a cool thing. That pattern of one, three, four finger wise is the next string, the exact same thing. So if we just go down one string, second fret, first finger, <laughs> sorry, 
Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, so we're now at the second fret with the first finger on the fourth string this time. Third finger on the fourth fret and pinky on the fifth fret. Do it again. First finger on the second fret of the fourth string. Third finger on the fourth fret of the fourth string. And pinky on the fifth fret of the fourth string. And these notes are E, F sharp, G. All right. Let me um, write out the D major scale. D, E, F sharp, G, A, B, C sharp, and D. Okay. So the new notes. So... The pentatonic scale was D, E, F sharp, A, and B. The new notes are the G and the C sharp. Those are the two notes that we added to that pentatonic scale to make it a major scale. Okay, so this is a major, um, you could call it uh, Ionian if you want. That's the, the kind of the Ionian scale. That's what a major scale is kind of officially called, you know, because when you hear, if you ever heard the term Mixolydian or Dorian or Phrygian, those are all the official terms for the scales. And then when we get to major minor, we never use the term Ionian or Aeolian. We always say major minor, uh, but the official term, and there's no quiz. You don't need to know this. I mean, if you really get into it, yes, learn, you know, learn that. But if you say, hey, play an Ionian scale to someone, they'll probably go, what the heck are you talking about? Okay. So, um, <laughs> What's the uh, what's with that half step after the root? No, I'm not. There's no there's no half step after the root. No, that's e, D to E is a whole step. Okay. So yeah, if it if there are a Phrygian does have a half step after the root. That's a minor scale, a type of minor scale. Okay, so let's play these first uh, three strings again. So we're second fret, first finger. Third fret, second finger, and then the A note, which is the pinky. Then next string down, B, which played with the, the first finger, then C sharp, and then D with the pinky. And then next string, second fret with the first finger, that's E. Third finger, that's F sharp, and then G again. And you, again, you'll notice, these two strings in this position, in the C form, the fifth string and the fourth string use the exact same fingers. You can even turn that into an exercise. I'm really big on just taking pieces of scales um, or little like melodic snippets within a scale and turning it into a repetitive exercise. Wow. <laughs> Dorian. Uh, wah, wah. Spelled the right way, though. I didn't really, I forgot about that hurricane. All right, everybody take a sip of the coffee. All right, so now the next string, we only have two notes. This is the only string on this particular um, scale uh, that we have just two notes on. So we're going to use just our first and third finger. So the first finger is going to be playing the A note on the second uh, second fret of the G string. And your third finger is going to be playing the B on the fourth fret of the third string. And this might be a good opportunity to practice keeping your pinky available. That might actually hurt. You might want to go, you know, tuck it away like that. But the idea is to kind of have it ready because you're going to need it on all the other strings. Okay. All right. The next shape is going to start on the second fret of the second string with the first finger. That's a C sharp. And here's our root again, D at the second finger, a third fret. And then fifth fret is with the pinky is the E. So first again, second fret, third fret, fifth fret. And you don't need to leave those fingers down. You can, as soon as you're done playing them, you can take them off. Okay, you don't need to go, you don't need to do that. And then the last string is the exact same fingering, one, two, and four. So we had the bottom string, which is one, two, and four, finger-wise, okay? 
the fingers we used for the scale. And the second string was one, two, four, and the top string was one, two, four. Whatever's done on the top string is going to be the exact same thing. It's going to mirror what's done on the bottom string because they're both E strings. So anything you do there is going to be the same. And for the more advanced, if you want to, you can take the scale. You can skip skip strings if you want um, and kind of come up with some patterns or what, whatever. Okay. All right. Let's do the whole scale. I'm going to hold it up again so you can screenshot if you haven't. This is the scale we're practicing right now. And you can see that the one, two, four pattern is on the bottom string and the top string and the second string. The one, three, four pattern is on the fifth string and the fourth string. And then the only string that only has two notes is the third string. And that's going to happen more than once because it's the third string. The third string is the outlier here often. Okay. So hopefully my hand wasn't shaking too much. Oh, wait. I got to give you the opportunity to get a non straily face screen cap. There we are. All right. So, yes, Ionian, Dorian, Phrygian, Lydian, Mixolydian, Aeolian, and Locrian. That's... The right order. See, Samal, you got an A plus already. <laughs> you're, you're the teacher's pet. Uh, yeah, those are the names of all of the uh, the modes, and uh, and then there's you know it, there's different modes for different types of scales. So I'm not going to get into that. I'm not you know I don't even that's that's a Rick Beato thing. You can you can learn all that stuff great from Rick Beato. Um, <laughs> I don't play like my Aunt Lucy. Now, I've never heard that before, um, but I don't play at all like my Aunt Lucy. So um, let's play this scale one more time. Actually, we're going to go up and we're going to come down. Hopefully, you're able to keep up with this, but let's. we're going to start from the beginning. Um, and I'm going to give you fret numbers, okay, instead of fingering. So we'll just start with fret numbers. Two, three, five. Two, four, five. Two, four, five, two, four, two, three, five, two, three, five. Backwards. Five, three, two, five, three, two, four, two. Five, four, two, five, four, two, five, three, two. All right, so there's our scale. Um, and we're gonna we're gonna stop there as far as that goes. I mean, I can show you. Uh, um, Uh, but it kind of so what I would do if you're a real beginner, just you maybe just use the scale as a warm up. It's probably not so. You see, you will learn stuff that you're using. You'll deeply learn things that you're using. Um, unfortunately, I'm waiting for uh, YouTube to remove a copyright infringement uh, on a D jam that I did, um, a jam thing. But you can find. Uh, on YouTube, you can find jam tracks that are just jam tracks in D major, whatever. If you want to kind of practice the scale while playing over music, what I don't want ultimately, if you're if you're a medium um, intermediate player or an advanced player, I don't want you just to play scales in that context. I want you to try to find melodies there um, in that in that context. And ultimately, you're you know we're obviously not going to just learn the one scale, so we're gonna you're gonna want to be moving around the fretboard more. But to really get the scale under your fingers, um, you know, get muscle memory going, you're going to, you know, maybe play this one only, kind of force yourself to stick to this scale. 
if you're a beginner, like I said, you can just use the scale. And here it is again. I see people coming and going. So if you want to do a screen cap, a screenshot, do that. Yeah. Um, um, what's his name? Uh, Rick Beato did teach at a university. So th that's why he kind of teaches at that level. Um, you almost have to just like pause it and like figure out what he was talking about and then go from there. Um, and, and he does and, and a lot of the stuff, like a lot of those scales that like, if you were to do all of the um, different modes of, of a mix of a, sorry, all the different modes of a harmonic minor scale, you know, that's going to be more for, um, you know, for pro prog rock kind of vibes, you know, uh, speed metal, maybe, you know, cause the harmonic minor is kind of that, that's the harmonic minor scale would be this one. <laughs> And I mean, Bach used it like crazy. And so it's not like you've heard that sound before. Um, and I'm not, don't worry, there's no quiz. I don't need you to know, know the term harmonic minor scale. Um, but I was I was working on a, a, a game. I was working on Apex Legends yesterday again. And um, the composer wanted me to play in just regular minor. You know, like he was a not harmonic minor, you know, so he wanted just regular minor. Um, okay, so I was talking about uh, the F chord. We're gonna, let me let me grab that. Let me find that. Uh, all right, let's see. Um, I'm gonna. I got the best way to search this is here, I think, and then go. Um, uh, let's see. I think I used darn. Only be one okay, so here is uh, for I forget who was asking me about saying they were having trouble with the bar chords. Um, but here's a video, and basically, what I kind of, I kind of, I really with my videos, I really try to be very realistic about things. If you can't get the F bar chord, I think I give you some alternatives, but I also give you some tips that I've learned through the years. Um, things that tricks that I've used to help get students to be able to play bar chords. And the great thing about bar chords is when you learn one chord, you've learned 12, there's no open strings in them. So it's really, it's, it's, it's a really a, a good way to exponentially increase your knowledge on the guitar. Um, and then I also uh, have the one, um, I think it's called, uh, let's see, son of a, son of, yeah, there it is. Son of a B chord. And so that's B chord is the, other bar chord that, you know, yeah. Oh, Ben, that's right. Ben Affleck. Thanks, Ben Affleck. Um, all right. So let's see, what else are we looking at here? Did I? Oh, <laughs> yeah. Beto, yeah, he kind of, he kind of assumes, oh, I, I really try hard not to assume it's really, really, really tough because I've been playing for 55 years or something. No, what am I? How old am I? <laughs> no, not 50. 50 years. I've been playing almost exactly 50 years. In fact, when I turn 59, it'll be 50 years ago in my birthday that I got my first guitar. Um, so that's kind of crazy. Uh, maybe I will do that video. I have a video idea that I want to do, but I can't quite get up to 50. I've only got 47, 47 ways to play the same note. Um, and, uh, I want to try to get to 50, but I may do that for my 50th anniversary of playing guitar. G major Ionian. Uh, yeah. G major Ionian is just G. It's just G major. Same thing. That's redundant to say G major Ionian. Um, and it's spelled with an I O N I A N. Um, Yeah. <laughs> yeah. My wife. No. Yeah. I don't know. No, no. Actually, the best birthday present my wife ever gave me was the birthday that she totally forgot that it was my birthday. And that was like I you know, that was the best gift she could have given me. Um, in fact, that it was funny because we were we actually we were flying back to Indiana with all three kids. And so that day was already a chaos day. It was my birthday. I. I land in Indianapolis and Beth's parents pick us up at the airport to give us a van. 
And then we go to, we drove to my mom's house. And uh, so they bring us a van and we're waiting for the bags. And I pull my father-in-law to the side and I say, I'm pretty sure Beth forgot my birthday. And he goes, you didn't tell her? I said, no. He goes, I don't want you to tell her either. And he's like, I don't know if I can do that. I said, yeah, you can't, don't tell her. And, you know, I said, I know what's going to happen. He goes, what? I said, we're going to pull up at my mom's driveway. We're all going to get out of the van. And the first thing my mom's going to say is happy birthday, Tom. And I'm just going to look at Beth's face and I just want to see that. And sure enough, exactly as I called it, we get out of the van uh, in in, uh, in my mom's driveway in Indianapolis. My mom comes out of the house and she says, happy birthday, Tom. And I look at Beth and she's just like, no, <laughs> totally forgot. And it was like, that was priceless. It was great. And uh, it's happened again since, believe it or not. It's just, you know, we, we're, we're not like really big celebrate we just never make big deals about well birthdays in particular the kids of course we did but for the two of us it was like we we're all about the kids my mom and beth was so mad at her dad for not telling him <laughs> it's pretty funny um so let's see am i on that gainy sound yeah so g major uh g major or g ionian would be g a b c d e f sharp g Okay. And uh, it's a seven note scale. You don't count the G twice. You just count the G one. So that's seven notes. That's a diatonic scale. <laughs> yeah, I guess. It, yeah, it's pretty funny. I mean, uh, there, there was another story like that where. Um, I forget. But he, My father-in-law had gotten a, a new car and it was. What was that thing called? Oh, oh, I can't think of it. It was like a really, he bought it because it was higher up and it was easier to, as you're getting older, you know, it's hard to get down in a low car. As my friend, the composer for um, the the music for uh, the game that I play, uh, one of the games I play on Apex Legend, he's got, he just got a Porsche, like a 911. And we, we went somewhere in it and uh, we went to the NAMM show together. And, and I mean, getting down and getting in and out of that thing is just like, I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm afraid I'm going to pull this door off and go lower myself into the seat. Hey, Miguel. So, uh, thanks, Gary. I appreciate that. Also, you can hit the bell if you want to be reminded um, that I'm doing this. Uh, the, the problem with the bell is that every day, because I'm doing this every day for now while we're in, uh, quarantine. I'm not technically in quarantine, but we're, you know, while we're all kind of being asked to stay at home, which is, which is a good thing, and I I do think it's going to end eventually. Um, but uh, or not, of course, it's going to end eventually, but it's sooner than than later. Um, uh, when when scientists and doctors make projections, the one thing they don't take into consideration is the ind industrial industriousness of people, and countries and companies and to fix things. And so we're all pulling in this together. Everybody's doing it. Um, and so we'll chip away at the back end on all of this. And when the, we get that curve to start on, you know, all the countries to start dropping. Um, it's been kind of encouraging to see things, ha what's been happening in a lot of ways, how people pulled together. Um, I'm single-handedly bringing back blowing kisses. <laughs> so when we're, Beth and I are out walking, if I see someone in an office or if I see someone walking across the street or, even on our sidewalk, it's crazy. If you're someone's coming down the sidewalk, the courteous thing now to do is to have one of the people drop down to the street and and separate, so you're not within six feet of each other. Um, but uh, yeah, it's I'm trying to you know bring back the the blowing kisses because uh, uh, handshakes are gone and hugs are probably gone now, so we're gonna have to find some substitute for that. But um, Anyway, I was telling you about my father-in-law. I got this really ugly car. Dang it. What was that car? What was it? I can't think of it. And, and Beth saw like three of them on the ride from the airport. in the van, And they were in the van coming from the airport. And she didn't say anything. And then we pulled a driveway in the, in the garage. And my father in my in-law's house goes up the garage door. And they got a two-car garage. And, and in the car is one of the – in the garage is one of those really, really ugly cars. <laughs> um, and so uh, – it, she was so glad she hadn't said anything. Well, of course, I used that against her, and I started saying things. Don't you really love your dad's new car, Beth? <laughs> Making her lie to her dad. It's, oh, yeah, it's nice. It's it's really interesting looking, you know. It, oh, man, I love the color, she said. <laughs> so it was just, I was just messing with her, but it was, just, it was, I was torturing her the whole, 
the whole week we're in 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 Greencastle, Indiana. So, you know, Ben, I don't know. I, you know, and I'll tell you the truth. I got depressed when I turned 20. I didn't get depressed when I turned 30, 40, 50. None of those. I'm coming up on 60. I mean, that sounds like an old number to me. I don't know. I feel good. I, I, I'm i getting to do what I want to do finally. It took my career forever to get going. You know, kids are always asking me, how, how do I get to do what you're doing? I'm like, really? No two paths are the same in this business. It's not like my son, my second son, Jack, is went to engineering school, mechanical engineering. He's working at JPL at NASA in Pasadena, and he's just finishing up his master's now at USC. Um, and he's getting all these job offers, and um, – but he, he really wants to stay at JPL. He's literally working on Mars stuff. Um, they are sending up a rover to Mars, I think in 2022, where it's going to land on Mars, okay? And then it's going to go around and get soil samples. Core, core samples, they're called, right? And then they, they're putting them in these, like, I think they're like titanium uh, test tube things. Uh, I touched my face. You guys got to take, come on, let's all take drinks. So, and my second son, he's 25. And so he's working at JPL. So they're sending up this pro, this uh, rover to Mars, taking samples. Then they send up another rover that's going to meet it, I think two years later. And it's going to take those samples and put them in these like medicine ball sized orbs and launch them into orbit. Okay, so now you've got these core samples orbiting Mars. So then <laughs> two years later, they launch this other probe that's gonna go up there and with, you know, keep in mind there's a 15 minute uh, electronic, you know, depending on how far the Mars is from Earth, I, it can be as much or, you know, in the 15 minute range, it's not instant. It's not like you can just use a joystick and grab something. Um, there's like a 15 minute lag in some cases, in some times of the year or whatever. Um, and um, so they're, they, they have this third thing that's going to grab um, that orb that's rotating, that's orbiting the Earth, I mean, orbiting Mars, and they're going to bring that in and they're going to bring that back to, to, to Earth. And so my son is designing the actual arm and hand that's going to grab that thing there he's on chart you know he's actually kind of like working a lot on it and he's having all these meetings and he's <laughs> it's really cool um so it's really fascinating to hear about this stuff now if we get some crazy virus <laughs> from mars that may be my fault <laughs> so for having jack as a son we'll see <laughs> um a gremlin yeah gremlins are one of those it's it was like that. Dang, what kind of car was that that my father-in-law got? I can't remember. It was, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll ask Beth. Tomorrow we'll talk about that one tomorrow, okay? Um, let's see, we're at 53 minutes. I used to play drums, Ben. Yeah. So anyway, oh, why did I get depressed at 20? Um, I got depressed at 20 because I was still in Indiana and I wanted to be in L.A. doing session work. I wanted to be Tommy Tedesco who was, you know, probably at, at, in his lifetime, the most recorded musician in the world. Um, uh, but he played on all these movies and game, uh, not games, uh, movies, TV shows and records. Um, and also like Steve Lukather, who played for, who plays for Toto. Um, he was doing major record sessions at 15, 16 years old. So when I turned 20, I thought I was already too old. Um, Lee Rittenauer was doing sessions when he was like 18, uh, Larry Carlton, all the, all the LA session guys, that's who I was really into. And I was buying, I would go to the record store and I would read, um, the liner notes and what, who, you know, I would buy albums. They could be the crappiest album. It didn't matter to me if they had the, any of the members of, of Toto on them, I would buy the album. Like if Jeff Beccaro played drums, I bought the album, you know, if, and I discovered a lot of great records. In fact, that's why I bought Christopher Cross's first record. Um, before it was even a hit, I'm like, before any, before any song came off of that record, um, I, I looked, was looking at the back of the record and it had Jay Graydon on it, who did the solo to Peg from Steely Dan, which is a great guitar solo. And, um, uh, it had, uh, I think Larry Carlton was on a couple tracks and 
this kid, this kid named Eric Johnson was on a track called Minstrel Minstrel Gigolo, and it's actually a really 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 good solo. Um, it it really was like wow, who is that? And I remember being really enamored though of the Jay Graydon solos and the Larry Carlton solos. And then my guitar teacher at the time says, "Yeah, I really like the solo by this Eric Cl Eric Johnson guy. I think that's the best solo on the record." And in hindsight, it, it was, but that was the Christopher Cross album. Uh, the self-titled one it had Sailing on it and Ride Like the Wind. We're talking like 1979, I think, right around my senior year of high school, maybe 1980. But I was just buying albums. And so, like, I didn't get moved to L.A. until I was 83. And then, you know, I moved here and then I didn't know how to start a career. There was no how-to method. I didn't know anybody. So that's 100 strikes against you right there. Um, and so that's why it kind of took so long to build a career. Um, and so many people came out here when I came out too. That was the other thing. Everybody was wanting to do that. I think guitar player magazine in an 18 month period, put three different LA session guitarists on the cover. I think Luke Luther Rittenauer and Tommy Tedesco were all on the cover of guitar player magazine within a two year period. And so session guitar players were kind of like rock stars there for in the early eighties. And, um, and that's kind of why I wanted to do it because it felt like something really fun to do. So, um, yeah, I'm sorry to hear that too, Ben. Uh, you try, you know, channel all that into your hands. It's it's got to be a drag. Um, do you have a do you have a chair you can sit in where you, you, the guitar's not hitting? Like I'm not sure what your daily routine is like, but are you able to have hold a guitar easily in your chair? Um, What a great community you guys are. Thank you so much for ignoring me and commenting on other stuff. <laughs> yeah. Um, my, my, my friend, Walter Rodriguez, who uh, made a guest appearance in a video that I did recently. Um, what was it the hi-hat groove? He said this the other day and I said, Oh my gosh, I'm going to have to do a video named that. Um, he said, um, he said, strumming is drumming. See, I don't think, am I doing this? Uh, strumming is drumming, snare hit. Oh, hi-hat, what's, what's the one I did? Oh, weird, why is that one twice there? That's weird. I gotta reorganize this playlist. It's not, it's kind of a mess. Um, and it looks like the one is not there. So let me see if I can find it. Um, so I, um, but Walter made an appearance in this and he he's one that kind of came up with the term strumming is drumming. So yeah, if you, you're generally, if you want to think about it, your right hand um, is on acoustic guitar in particular is uh, the same as, you know, playing a hi-hat. You know, I tell people, you know, kind of watch what the drummer's doing on the hi hat. If he's playing eighth, sixteenth notes, then you're gonna you're gonna want to be do doing downstrokes on every eighth note to create a sixteenth note pattern. If he's doing more like eighth notes on it, then you can do downstrokes on just the downbeats, and then that way you have the upstroke as the eighth note. Um, so you kind of, I always tell guitar players, watch the drummer's hi hat for to get your right hand. So your right hand is gonna lock with the drummer's right hand, and the bass player's right hand is gonna lock with the drummer's right foot, the kick drum. Um, and so that's kind of where I, I say, hey, look how we can all work together here. Um, let's see, strumming. Where's the strumming? All right. The snare hit. I think it was the hi-hat groove. Yeah, it was this one. So this is the one where Walter made a little appearance. And if you want, if you know any drummer, if you have any drummer friends, uh, maybe have them follow Walter. He needs to get to a thousand subscribers before he can really monetize. And I said, I think I put a link in there. Um, Let's see. Um, hold on. I see the question about singing, to sing and play at the same time. Uh, my young, I, I, boy, I learned to, to sing and play at the same time just through serious, serious repetition. I basically, what it was, was I was in a band with my wife and um, she was the lead singer and 
I um, needed to add background vocals. And so I, when we were recording, I put background vocals on, but then I had to practice just practice singing them. So it's, I think what for the best way to, to get your singing and your playing together is to take a song that's very simple that, um, because it's really kind of one of those things. It's just a switch. Once it's turned on, it's easier for every song, but it's really hard to turn it on the first time. Um, so for singing and playing at the same time, I would take a very simple song that you know you can sing. you got it memorized. You don't need to look at words or melodies or anything like that. And chord-wise, strumming-wise, both your right hand and your left hand can be on autopilot. You don't need to think about it. One thing you could do is you could practice a song, say, and try to talk at the same time. And if you can talk and play at the same time, you can sing and play at the same time. Okay, but it's just a matter of getting those two things together. And it's almost even easier because talking and playing at the same time are left and right brain. Whereas um, if you're singing, you're trying to sync with what you're hand, you know, doing. If I if I'm not if I'm not able to separate my talking from my strumming, I might have to talk in time with what I'm playing, you know. And I don't have to do that because I'm able to separate those things. But then ultimately, when you're singing, you're going to be syncing those two things together. And so I would just start with a very, very simple song and just practice and practice it. Maybe just start with the chorus um, and just but have them both both elements, the singing, the melodies, the words memorized and the left, the guitar, the chords, the strumming, all that memorized. So you're not having to read anything. Uh, I got pretty good at it when I was leading worship. I mean, I was. You know, I was at one point I was leading worship at four different churches every weekend, a Saturday morning church, a Sunday, Saturday night church, a Sunday morning, a Sunday night church. And and I was doing different sets at every one of those churches. So it was it was a lot. um, Did I did I share a high? I yeah, I've got I've got some I've got some pretty embarrassing hair pictures. You know, the reason my my hair was so I had some pretty funny hair moments in the 80s because. I hung out with a lot of artists, like art, you know, like art students and stuff like that, and um, I let them cut my hair. <laughs> so I, I remember one time I, I let a friend cut my hair, and he was he didn't know how to cut hair, but he just wanted to cut you know hair and for fun for art, and he created like this stair step going down the back of my head. You know, it was like boom, boom, boom these steps. And I remember sitting somewhere <laughs> in an audience and hearing people behind me laughing. And I'm like, uh, uh, they're laughing at me, you know. I just assumed, but. Um, uh, let's see. Am I, is this touching my face? I don't think so. That's not touching my face. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I'm glad you're able to work, work though, Chris. There's a lot of people right now that can't do that. So <laughs> I, I don't want to keep you from that. Uh, let's see. Which guitarist was popular in recording sessions when you moved to LA? Um, Basically, uh, by the time I got to L.A., Lee Rittenauer and Larry Carlton were both making their own records and touring and not doing sessions. Um, I would say uh, Jay Graydon, um, uh, who did the solo to Peg on Steely Dan. And that's a great story. You can look that up on YouTube. Um, the Making of Asia. Um, that That's a, a, a documentary that's really, really good. And uh, Asia is spelled this way. If you don't know Steely Dan. Oh, David, how's your mom doing? Um, so there's that, that, the making of Asia, Steely Dan. You can see a little bit about that. It's kind of interesting because on that on the song Peg, um, they had a bunch of people come in and do solos. Um, and that's really cool because you, because the thing I like about these documentaries and the company that did the making of Asia did a bunch of them. Like they did the making of John Records and... Judas Priest, all these tons of records. So you can find them on YouTube. It's really, really fascinating because what they do is they sit down with the master tapes and they start soloing things. And they had, you know, they had to listen to these tapes in sometimes 30, 40 years. And they start soloing going, oh, wow. Oh, yeah, I forgot that. And like on the Asian one, there's uh, Michael, Michael, uh, um, Michael McDonald sang on it. And he was saying it was the hardest thing he'd ever done because they, you know, Peg was like, that's him going, Peg! you know, and he's doing these like, like, Oh, I can't. I don't have my keyboard up. Hold on. Uh, see, I don't really have any. See, this isn't. You can't really hear that. Um, but basically, uh, he was doing all these tight voicings. He was harmonizing with himself in overdub. So that was pretty cool. But you can check out the making of and then Asia one, and then maybe that 
um, whoever posted that posted all the other ones too. Um, uh, there's some great ones, Elton John and stuff like that. So check that out. But uh, Jay Graydon was one of the session guitar players. But then right around the time I got here before, maybe a little after, well, Tim Pierce was around and he's got a channel that's great. Um, you can check out Tim, P Tim Pierce's channel. And he hit the ground running because he got an, and I, he may have been from here. I don't know where he's from. Um, but uh, he was playing with um, uh, Rick Springfield, you know, Jesse's, Jesse's, uh, you know. And he is a friend. Yeah, I know he's been a good friend of mine. That song. Um, and so they, I don't know. I think Tim came on right after that, but basically was touring with a very popular artist, got a lot of street cred and got a lot of experience. Um, uh, Michael Thompson is another guy. I know Michael. I know Tim and Michael. Um, and then uh, Carl Verheyen was another guy. Now, Carl is more doing, um, I think that's how you spell his name. It may be E-N at the end. It may be all E's. Uh, but Carl's a great guitar, amazing guitar player. And I actually, one of the things I did when I came out here in 82 to see if I wanted to live here, I, I went to a lot of clubs because I just turned 21. So I could actually do that. I knew that that was a prerequisite for me checking out. And I, you know, came out and I'd never been West of the Mississippi. You know, I was by myself and I go, and I go to this club called my, uh, at my place in Santa Monica. It's not there anymore. And there was a Richard, Smith, I think, was a sax player playing there. And I went to see any live music I could see. And this guy named Larry or uh, Carl Verheyen was playing with him. And he was like crazy amazing. So I met him afterwards. And then I said, hey, can I take a lesson? So I went to his apartment in Van Nuys while I was out here visiting and took a, my first lesson with Carl was then. I continued to take lessons, uh, maybe another five, six lessons. I really couldn't afford it. When I moved out here, I just didn't have any money. Um, and I mean, I had enough to kind of keep me afloat, um, and just doing different jobs, working at a record store, working for a jewelry company. I mean, just anything I could do to kind of keep, keep stay in LA. And then I started teaching private lessons again, because I had to quit the job in Indiana that I had 40 students at. So obviously I couldn't teach remotely. Um, am I a Doors fan? No, I am not. I don't know why I've been to Jim Morrison's grave in Paris, um, which is really fun to go to. Uh, uh, Pierre Lachey in Paris. Uh, Pierre Lachey, not Pierre, Pierre Lachey. Um, I, I never really got into Doors. I, I mean, I was a big Beatles fan. So it was really, really, really hard for any band to kind of live up to that quality of music, in my opinion. So the Beatles were kind of my true, true fan thing. Um, another guitar player, let's see, I thought, oh, in the movies, I, I, I'm good friends with them now. Um, Joe DeBlasi, um, he, um, he is, um, <laughs> it's funny. You guys are all hitting on Joe Bonamassa. I, you know, I, I, I like him, but I, I don't know. It's, 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 I'm not, it, it, he doesn't, I'm, I don't have, I mean, I have a bunch of Joe Bonamassa CDs cause I know his manager and they, he gave me a bunch of records and I haven't even listened to him. Uh, but I know he's a great guitar player and he's got a great guitar collection. I don't know where he got the money for those guitars, but oh my gosh, how many like 59 Les Pauls does he have? It's crazy. Yeah. Verheyen is, is, it is EN, isn't it? Thanks, David. Uh, Zeppelin, of course, a huge Zeppelin fan. Um, I also had some weird art bands that I was into. Oh, gosh, we're I, we're gonna talk forever. I'm gonna go forever on this. <laughs> we're not careful, um, and I want to get out and take a walk here in a minute. But um, I really, really liked. Um, yeah, Zeppelin was definitely. I had every Zeppelin record. Learned. I played in bands that did Zeppelin songs. Um, did not get into Hendrix. Thought he was sloppy. Um, kind of one of those things. Sometimes you don't appreciate someone. Cause see, I started getting to jazz. When I hit 14, 15, I got, uh, when I was 15, I got the George Benson Breezen record. And even though that's kind of a smooth, like the, the smooth jazz record. And I really, to, to be honest, I feel like 1976 is when jazz died. When that Breezen record came out, which I love and loved at the time came out, it killed jazz because he made so much money off of that record 
that then all the jazz artists went and tried to recreate that success. And I felt like jazz, which was, if you looked at jazz every 10, 15 years, it would step up. You know, it was like you go way back, you know, Dixieland. And then, you know, you had swing and then you had bebop and you had cool jazz and you had, you know, some experimental jazz and you had fusion jazz and boom, you know, Mahavishnu Orchestra in the seventies, you know, and then Breezen hits. <laughs> it's like, then everybody is making stupid smooth jazz records. And so it was kind of like, oh man, you know, where would jazz have gone if it had never gotten, it never made any money. It was just a, an amazing, it's an amazing art form jazz is. So, uh, and Grateful Dead is another band that I never really got into. Um, it's funny because I have a lot of friends I really respect. But Dylan is another one. You know, like I, I just never got into Dylan. One thing, like I said, I got, I got when I got into jazz, anything that wasn't jazz, and then I started studying classical music. Um, anything that wasn't jazz or classical, I just kind of poo-pooed as being um, uh, pedestrian. You know, I was a snob. I was a snob. Um, and so it's been kind of fun to go back, like with Hendrix, it was a blast. Stevie Ray Vaughan was another one I didn't really appreciate at the time. I had students bringing me his records all the time, but I didn't really appreciate it until I actually had to play in a blues band. And I realized how hard it was. Chet Atkins, I was a huge fan of Chet Atkins. Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young, I'm a huge fan. Um, they're, uh, and, uh, um, they're great. Um, Jerry Reed, amazing. I was into, I love Jerry Reed. Um, I used to be able to play The Claw, but I, it's been forever. I don't know if I can remember it. <laughs> Blasphemy, sorry. <laughs> Eric Johnson, of course. Got got into Eric Johnson. I mentioned him in, a little while ago. He His first exposure to the world was on that air. Uh, if you haven't listened to it, uh, check out Minstrel Gigolo by, um, uh, by uh, Christopher Cross from 1980, I think. Um, and, uh, that record won a ton of Grammy awards. And that was the first time the world had heard Eric Johnson really N never got into, Meta never really got into heavy metal Metallica. Um, uh, it's, you know, yeah, Stevie Ray Vaughan, but, but he also tuned down, didn't he? Didn't he tune down a half step? So that makes it Paul Roger was great. Um, yeah, no, studying jazz and studying classical, the, the, the discipline and, and technique I learned from classical was really good. It, classical really gave me my right hand. And to be honest, for the pop stuff that I do, a lot of the work, the things that I've done, uh, the songs, the stuff I've done with Bieber and stuff, it really relies heavily on my right hand. And that I, I really credit my, my studies in classical guitar. Um, jazz kind of helped me with harmony and learning the fretboard um, and um you know, at one point I couldn't really find a band, any bandmates when I was in junior high. So I thought I'd be just like a solo jazz guitarist, you know, and kind of just be doing um, uh, just like, you know. Uh, I can't remember. So I kind of got into doing that. I thought, well, if I can't if I can't find a band, I'll just be the band. And so I really got into that. And the cool thing was, I would sneak into bars and and uh, hotels, you know, the hotel bars that were literally back in the '70s. There were guys like Jim Hall and Herb Ellis that were just touring around, and they would play in a different hotel every night. And there would be just a bunch of people there sitting, listening, smoking cigarettes, and drinking martinis. And and I would just sit in there and just as close as I could get to the guitar player without being discovered <laughs> because I wasn't allowed to be in there. I, I actually, when I was, you know, in 18, 19 years old, I'd play in bands in, in nightclubs and they would literally make me during breaks stand outside and it could be minus 20 outside. And I'd be standing, the band would be just like laughing at me because that band was all 20 years older than me that I played with. Um, so Leo, what's going on, man? Um, Opinion question. I love playing with a strap, but classical always slips. Any tricks? Classical slips. Huh. I don't know. Classical, you should. Now, if you sit with proper technique, your, your left leg should be up and the, uh, whatever that's called, not the horn, but the that part of the guitar uh, should be on your leg and it should be tilting towards you a little bit, but you don't want the body, you don't want if you have a big belly, you don't want the guitar to be touching the back of the guitar to be touching. My guitar teacher, when I studied, when, when I studied uh, classical guitar, he said, "Don't, 
don't touch. <laughs> so it's interesting. Don't touch the top and don't touch the back for sure. And if you can help it, don't even touch the sides. So what, but the, the, your leg had to be on the side like this, but, but as far as your arm goes, your arm would be at an angle so that it would only be touching the edge of the guitar because the, the guitar, you can't really hear that. But if I mute the, if I hold the top of the guitar, it really gets quieter and stops the, the wood stops vibrating. So the goal is to touch it as little as possible to keep the resonance of the wood and the, uh, the front and the back to allowing them to, to vibrate. So, um, yeah, so maybe a changing ergonomics, uh, cha the chair that you're sitting in, um, maybe get a um, one of these, something like this to put your foot on, foot rest. Um, that will allow you to lift your left leg up and rest your guitar on that. And that and that's also better for all of the fingerings and the positions and things like that. Your, your body just, I mean, you'll see some people, they'll practically hold the guitar like this, even those paintings you see. Um, and some people, and even electric guitar players, I've seen some guys put their straps like this so they can play, um, you know, almost vertically. Um, so I do wear my electric wise. I do wear my guitar high. Now you can get a classical guitar strap. They do make ones uh, just that, that actually clip on here and then come around and then go around your neck and then it, it'll hang. So like I see mariachi guys use those if they're standing in a restaurant playing classical guitar. That's what they use. Um, you can get one of those. It's probably not the best for the guitar. It might hurt the opening a little bit, but that could work. Um, uh, let's see. I did start a series. Um, I didn't really go too far with it because it was hugely unpopular. <laughs> oh, my series are hugely unpopular. Um, but I, uh, yes, actually, it's funny because I just was sent Rodrigo and Gabriela I was just sent some music from them because I am working on a movie and they, they want to do some rumbas and some sambas and stuff like that. So I've been practicing my rumba and sambas at grooves and things like that. And that's one of the things I've been listening to them and the gypsy Kings. It's basically what the music's going to be like. The whole movie is going to be like that. So I have to work on that. Um, okay. I'll check out that. Um, that's, it's not unusual for um, metal people to be metal players, guitar players to be really into classical music. Like I said, you know, Ingby Malmsteen is probably can play any Bach piece on the guitar. It's crazy. Um, I met Ingby actually the like the two days after he moved to L.A. back in 83. I met him very early when he first got out here. Um, he was a mutual. You know, we had a mutual friend. But my series, I did a series on uh, Giuliani arpeggios. Um and so basically I, I was picking out, kind of picking out some of my favorite Giuliani arpeggios. Um, one of my favorites is, and, and so when you're studying classical guitar, there's two things you work on, you know, like two things is Segovia scales. Where Andre Segovia sat down and, and looked at all 24 scales. Uh, he, he did 12 major scales and 12 harmonic, uh, melodic minor scales. Melodic minor are uh, scales that have a raised sixth and seventh going up and then they're back down going down. So like G harmonic minor would be. Um... Sorry, it's been a while. So going up, it was this. different going down than it is going up so that um and and so that you would spend time practicing those and I'll, if you want to work on a, a there's a trick i can show you for trying to play those faster um and one of the things i you would do would be gosh i mean remember we were talking about all the different fingering possibilities index middle middle you know the, all of that um another one you could do is an a dotted eighth to a sixteenth That's a really good uh, pattern rhythm to use to try to get your right hand faster. That's my weak hand, really, as far as uh, speed. I can I, I could never get it very fast. So, um, and then the other thing that you would work on were Giuliani arpeggio. So, like, and basically, it'd be two chords. You wouldn't be working on the left hand at all. It'd all be right hand exercise. So it could be something.
and then what my guitar teacher did that just pissed me off. <laughs> and it just made me, it's so hard, but he would say accent, like. You know, pick one note and accent it every time. And then another, another, do it again. Now accent this note. And wow, that is hard. And he, you know, it was all really good stuff, but, but just doing all the different versions of the, um, uh, Segovia scales with a different right hand and rhythms and all that could take two hours every day. And then the Giuliano arpeggios would take, I would spend two hours every day working on Giuliano arpeggios. And I mean, it was oh, so. Yeah. So um, let's see. Well, and yeah, so there's a, I do have a, a I think, I think I, um, I set it out here. Let's see. Open Canadian's business. Keeping tips storming. Oh no, I don't have. Okay, let me let me see if I can find the finger. Um, I do I do have a finger. Uh, let's see exercises. Oh, here's the exercise playlist. I'll put that one up there. That was what we started with. One of that, that exercise is in there. F finger picking lessons. Here we go. Um, so let me put this playlist in there because this is really where you guys can help me. Is if you watch these videos, of course I make money from it, right? I, I guess I make money from this. I'm not sure how they how this generates. Here's my. Um, but if you start going through some of these videos and watching them, um, yeah, accent notes are really hard. It's really, really hard. Um, but there's, there's a reason for that. Um, because when you're playing classical guitar, you want to accent certain notes. And um, when you're playing, you want that melody to ring true. So, um, yeah, exactly. I'm working on stuff myself. I'm, I'm working on the Roomba things. Okay, so, uh, oh, yeah, that's, that's I think, the finger pit. Yeah, that's the finger picking playlist. Here's the exercise. Here's, here's some playlist, a copy um, of some of the playlists. All right. I'm going to sign off now. Um, I'll leave the chat up and I'll see you tomorrow. Um, I may have to go through this chat. You guys have been chatting a lot. You're not paying attention to me at all. Um, <laughs> so, but uh, I, I want to go through the chat and see if there's anything, any questions jumping through. Gypsy Jazz, I love that. We talked about that yesterday. Um, uh, I'm reading uh, the biography of Django Reinhardt, the best biography of Django Reinhardt. I'm reading that right now. So, so tomorrow we're going to get another scale. We're going to do another diatonic scale. Don't be discouraged. Just play along. Um, I'll go slow for the beginners. And, um, you know, once we get through these five diatonic scales, um, you'll have all five of them. Then I might move on to a different subject. We might get off of the caged method. But again, the caged method is only the, we're only talking for about 30 minutes on whatever the lesson is. And then the rest of it's just me kind of answering some of these uh, questions and things like that. So, so anyway, check out playlist. Um, feel free to promote, uh, you know, on your Facebook pages or whatever um, that I'm doing this. If you know anybody that's playing guitar or whatever, and um, we'll see you tomorrow. Okay. Take care. Thanks. Thanks for being such a good group and helping each other. I love that. That makes me happy. <laughs>